want to thank everybody again for joining us for Process and Practice. Uh, today we've got uh, Cedric Douglas, uh, Creative Director of Uptruck, and uh, so glad uh, to welcome him. Uh, he's from Boston, Massachusetts, uh, and I believe you're in your studio today, Cedric. So thank you so much for being with us today. Yes, thank you for having me. My pleasure to be here. So for the uh, for the audience, can you give us a little bit uh, background, let people know sort of what you've been up to, and and then we'll just uh, we'll start from there. Um, um, yeah, so my name is Cedric Douglas, but I go by Vice One. That's my um, artistic name. It stands for Vice. It stands for Visually Intercepting Society's Emotion. So we can probably talk a little bit about that later. But um, so what I've been up to is. I'm at the studio today, just planning out stuff for the next up, up and coming months. Um, but my recent project that I've been working on is the People's Memorial Project, and it's projecting people that are underrepresented, mainly Black, um, Latinx, and um, Indigenous people um, of this local Massachusetts area on in a, a style called projection mapping with a team of, that I'm working with um, onto foam base. Um, and a recent project was done on the Christopher Columbus bus in the North End um, because that statue was removed. And we've been thinking about ways to continue doing that project. So that's my recent project that I've done in like the last project, but there's other projects I've been working on as well. So what, um, you know, I, it's, it's been great that you've been able to continue to produce work and do projects during this, what has been kind of a tough year for everybody, especially in my mind, artists and designers. And we've been talking to a few in the last few months. Um, has anything changed or, or have you been energized by what's been going on or sort of like how, what, what's been your trajectory this, this past year or so? Um, things at the beginning of COVID, I definitely would like to say that I was a little bit nervous. One, just nervous of what was happening in the world. Just like I did a lot of research and seeing like what was happening at the people were nervous about doing projects and um, some of the projects I had lined up just people were just like nope um, some were connected to different colleges and universities those ones stopped like just a lot of things just stopped and I was actually a little nervous like what about work you know what's going to happen what does this mean at the time there wasn't really any um, the government of Massachusetts wasn't really saying that they were going to give unemployment to gig workers or people that are independent contractors. And for my organization, I didn't really pursue applying for grants. So I was kind of nervous. And then, it, then they finally changed that. But at the time I was um, really struggling about, should I create art in regards to what was happening? It was just a weird point for me because I'm like, this thing is crazy. I'm researching and seeing what's going on. It's like, um, a lot of my work is based off of like direct reactions to things that are happening on happening in society. And I'm just like feeling like I need to be creating art about this. But at the time, I just kind of was just processing it. And I just like was like said to myself, it's okay if I don't paint, if I don't create anything um, in regards to this, just let it just let it sit and let it settle with me and, 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 and try to understand with it and try to connect with my family. Um, in, in, in my outside family, my, you know, just really trying to connect with people and trying to process it. So, but as an artist, I'm constantly at my studio. My studio luckily was open. So I was able to work at my studio. Um, I worked on different projects and did some, a lot of planning and I watched a lot of podcasts and just kind of like, was just thinking, did a lot of thinking and not really like doing it. And this is like the earlier part of COVID. Um, but as COVID progressed, I said, you know, I got to just focus on trying to not make projects about what's happening, but just make continue the products that have already started and focus on that. And that's kind of where I was just kind of got out of that whole kind of creative block. But so I've been working on this project called Street Memorials. And what Street Memorials does is take things from the street environment and giving it new context to, to create meaning and, and meaning about what was happening with, with police killing black men and women in society. And um, I've been really focused on that for the last four years. And I really wanted to kind of continue that project. And then I just kind of like, um, so it's hard to explain this all because it's kind of like, yeah. I really started like focus on like my own personal work mm -hmm. and then what gets killed. And right. I'm yeah. like, what? 
And COVID-19 made people just really stop and think what they care, made them really think about what was meaningful to them with not working and being like hyper-focused on, just like me, on what's happening in our society and not be um, distracted by work or other things, outside forces or sports or all these different things. Everything was canceled. So you had to focus on what was really happening. And so I created this project called Tools of Protest. And Tools of Protest was created um, about four years ago. And there were memorials to three people that were killed by police. One was to John Crawford III. Um, the other one was to Eric Gardner. And the, and the third one was to Mike Brown. So they were caution tape that had the last words that they said before they were killed. And at the time, I really wasn't engaged with protests. But I wanted to create art so people to use during protests um, to kind of make their voices heard in different ways. So this is kind of what, what, it, what it looks like. So it says, don't shoot. And it's on a roll and it's meant to give out to people so they can use for protests. And at the time, no one really was, I reached out to different organizations mm -hmm. and they weren't that, you know, they're like, oh yeah, it's cool. No one really was interested in using it. And I was trying to find ways of how I could get this stuff out to people. And it kind of was just sitting at my studio. And there was one organization that used it two years ago. Um, it was police, um, Mass Lives Against Police Brutality. They used it in a protest in Rosendale um, for a black man that was killed by police. And other than that, I really, it actually was used at two protests um, that they used. They did one over in, on, in downtown Dudley through Mass Ave, they did a protest. So they used it again for that protest as well. But other than that, it really wasn't used. And I wanted to get this out to people. But in the wake of George Floyd, people across the whole United States and across the world even started realizing this issue is, is a problem. And that's when I just started passing these tapes out. And then they went so quick and I just been giving them to people for use. And I actually, me and my partner, Julia, we actually went to protest ourselves and passed them out and cut them and gave them to people at protests with COVID-19. We had our mask on and gloves, but had scissors and people just grabbed an end and we just cut them, cut them, cut them, cut them, cut them, cut them. And we went through um, about 200, 200 foot rolls. We went through, I think like, I think like 60 of them. And we had some left over from before and we ended up purchasing another 60 more. And so we went through a lot of caution tape um, for people to use. You know, it's sad that we have to even have this to yeah. use, but it was really awesome to see that people actually were using it for protests. And we started shipping out to different um, states, to people in different, um, Houston, Rhode Island, um, Vermont, um, Oregon, um, just a few cities that we, we shipped it out to so people can use during protests. Now, I, I know on that same, uh, you know, group of work that you did were the, um, you know, the markers obviously in, in Boston um, that you started to put together to mark where some of these things have occurred and to sort of just make sure people understood uh, the violent thing that may, you know, that happened at that corner or in that yeah. what seems to be a relatively serene space. And by the way, violence visited this, this place and trying to really kind of bring people's awareness up. One of the things that you have talked to me about um, that I was, I was hoping you might want to say a little bit more about is, you know, that started off right as a guerrilla art project, right? And then there's the city of Boston, you know, calls you up, right, and wanted to do a map. I think that's what you were talking to me about. Can you, yeah. can you talk a little bit about, you know, your own processing of that? Because obviously it started sort of this protest, guerrilla art piece, then all of a sudden the city itself, rather than rejecting it or pushing it off, uh, was in that sort of accepting mode and wanted to actually document it and push people out to see these things. So. Yeah. Um, or at least that's how you described it the last time we talked about it. So. It, even, it even goes a step further than that, like going okay. back. So this goes back, this project, these street memorial signs, I think I created it almost eight years ago. It might even be 10 now. So my uncle, his name was Daniel Edwards. His graffiti name was Devs. We grew up in um, Dorchester on Faston Street. And we grew up in my, a huge Jamaican family, 13 um, uncles and aunts. And Danny was my age. We were like similar in age. And he taught me how to do graffiti. So he inspired me to do all this work that I'm doing now. And, and I'm like 
forever thankful for that. So I wanted to create a memorial for him when he passed away. Danny, everyone in the neighborhood knows Danny. He has, he's a charismatic person. So we wanted to um, create something to honor him. And no one goes to graveyards. Like, you know, people just don't do that. So I wanted to create a street sign that memorialized him. And this was not even, even connected to black men and women being killed by police. It was just something I wanted to do for my uncle. Growing up, he as a graffiti writer, he always had an MBTA bus sign in his room with graffiti all of it, my name, other graffiti writers' names. And it was just something that he did. So one day I was just like, what if I did a bus sign? No, that doesn't make sense. And then it just hit me like a toe zone. Instead of toe zone, dev zone. That's the street where we grew up. And I created a dev zone sign to represent his life. And we put it right on the street in front of the house where we grew up and um, from a little kids in, in Boston. And after that happened, I think it was two, maybe two years later, two and a half years later, mm -hmm. there was a, um, a neighbor of ours who lived down the street um, named Odin Lloyd. Odin Lloyd was killed by Aaron Hernandez, a, a football player for the New England Patriots. And it was like this high profile thing. And, but people knew what we did for Danny and they wanted to create a memorial for Odin to put in front of their house to mark Odin's existence um, similar in a similar manner so people can kind of um, show their respects to him in, in a way where it's it's there, it's present, but it's not really, you can't really notice it as well. So I said, no, I want to really do this for my uncle. And then I said, you know what? Let me give this to someone to let them deal with the mourning of their loved ones. So then I created two signs. So that was how it kind of started. I did, I did one for my uncle and then it was like, let's do one for Odin. And then me and my partner, we were in Art Basel uh, I forget what year this was. It might have been, I um, can't remember the year, but we went down to Art Basel, which is an international art festival. Over 150,000 people come from all over the world. And we were there, we were going to paint murals. And there was like, towards the end of the festival, there was a young, a young person, graffiti artist, who was killed by police. A cop chased him and ran him over and killed him. Mm. And he died in the hospital. He had like a, a kid on the way and he was like, I saw my youngest self in him. Like if I was 20, I would be doing graffiti. How, if I got killed for doing it, 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 would, it just, it just struck me like, you know, and, and it's like thinking about, and at the time I'm thinking about police brutality and just like thinking about this. I'm like, I need to create a sign for him. And I created a sign and I think it was a year later, I installed it at the site right where he was killed by police during Art Basel. And then after that, I was just like, I need to do these for black and black men that were killed by police, um, black men and women, I should say, that were killed by police. And that's when I was like, I need to create these signs. So back in Boston, um, Terrence Coleman was killed by police. He was 30 years old. Um, he has, um, he had, I think, bipolar. His mother called for him to get a value at the mental hospital. The police came and they said, the cop said he grabbed a knife. He said, he, his mother said he didn't, he was killed. So I created a memorial sign to put at the site where he was killed. Maybe we need to think about if someone has a mental, mental disability, how can we fi find ways where they don't die and they get brought to the mental hospital? So I created a sign to memorialize him that was installed on the building right in the hallway where he was killed in the South End of Boston. And then I created, I created one for uh, Raheem. Um, he was another black man that was killed by police in, in uh, Rosendale. And, um, I want to create these signs and put them on all the sites and not, I mean, not every site, but at a lot of the sites where um, black men were killed by police. So that's something that I'm, that's a continual project that I will be continually working on. But when I did the sign, the, the city of Boston found out about it. When I did the one on Faston street in, in Dorchester, where I grew up mm -hmm. and they reached out to me and I thought that I was going to get in trouble for this. And they were like, no, we actually think it's a really good example of a modern day memorial. Can we do a tour? There was this big art conference coming and they wanted to talk about a modern day memorial. And I was like, what? You, you, I did this illegally, you know that. And they were just like, no, it's fine. We, we want to show people what this looks like. So I said, sure. I was kind of weird about it, bringing a bus to my old neighborhood. like. Mm -hmm. Well, like, like it's just kind of weird, and I was kind of yeah. finally said yes because I, I think it's important, and it's a way I can like my uncle, you know, it's 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 keeping his legacy alive too. So we did it. People came down, and I explained about my uncle and talked about the sign and why I did it, and we also talked about Odin's sign, and his Odin's mother came out and talked about the sign, 
and um, what it means to their family. And I was really shocked, you know, because, and, and then actually there was end up a person that was there that ended up um, inviting me to talk about it at a local college. Um, but the thing is, is like, it made me really think because I don't really, I, I, I got my roots as a graffiti artist back in the early nineties and I did graffiti illegally. And it was a way for me to show, express myself in a huge world that I felt like people didn't even know I exist. Um, and I'm doing this illegally just because I had a love for my uncle and to keep his legacy alive and give love to people and give something for people to connect with in the community. And, you know, it's like, sometimes you think about some things illegally and it's also respected, even though it's done illegally. So that was a really good example of showing you, showing how something can be done illegally, but also then appreciated by the city who's, you know, who I got arrested for doing graffiti and putting things up illegally in that same neighborhood. Um, so that was kind of a flip and, and it was interesting. And it made me think maybe there's ways of doing, doing that again in ways where if it's done with really good intentions, maybe people will look at it in a different way. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's, um, I, there's a lot of depth there. It sounds like something that's going to continue to evolve too, which I think is, you know, yeah, in its own way, a good thing. But I've been really thinking about ways I could either, I can't travel to every site where it happens, but ways, almost like the tools of protest where I can create the kit and people can install them at the site, the family, oh, yeah. the, the neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, something similar to where they can install and I send, I give them the kit they can ship out. And then some of them that feel like that I feel real important, I'll go myself and install. So yeah. I'm trying to figure out the funding and ways that could happen. So that project can, can grow because it's been sitting and it's just, that's one of the things that's been blocking that project from growing. It's yeah. like, I can't, I don't have endless flight tickets. Right. <laughs> you know? But I think it, I, it sounds like a great idea, honestly. It's, and then it gets other people involved, right? So their, their emotional attachment, their ability to process, their ability to deal with sort of the, in a way, the, the reasoning behind why you started it, it sounds like, and then uh, facilitating their ability to do the same thing, which I think is yeah. a great idea. The other, um, so on that um, theme, um, the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit uh, before we wrapped up was, you know, what are other projects you're thinking about? Sort of what, what uh, um, have you started? You know, some people I've talked to have started to think post pandemic, uh, others haven't. Um, where are you right now in regards to sort of making plans or thinking about what, what the next series of things are? Um, um, I'm going to say something, but I, I kind of want to jump back because I just thought about something. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. After, after, we, after I say this. Yeah. So um, post-pandemic, to me, since I started focus on my work, it's kind of a weird thing is because, you know, one of the things I do, I chant and I meditate and I chanted and meditated on what I should be doing next. And I, and it said, and, and, and I, and I came to this knowledge, I, I got the knowledge within myself to go, I need to focus on my own work. Don't focus on the pandemic stuff. Don't force yourself to do something because it's happening at the time. Focus on what you've been doing. Use this time to work on projects that you haven't done, update stuff and really connect with the work you're doing. And that's when I did that. And I started thinking about ways I can connect with this work. And then that's when George Floyd passed away. And that's when all this work started going, pushing out into the world. And it re-inspired me. And other artists I started seeing doing a lot of work um, in regards to police, but people I didn't know about that were doing this as well years ago and just at the moment. And it really inspired me to really wanted to push this work even more and to join with other people's cause because you know, and it's kind of sad that no one really, I couldn't get people to, and I almost hold myself accountable. That I wasn't able to get the word out enough for people to like, to, to take it, to take it um, to heart. And, um, and there was, you know, so that, that really um, bothered me, but I was really busy. I was doing projects. I was doing talks, like, as, as soon as I went and really focused on my own work and went in, I started getting busy and I started doing work and my work is really reflected on what's happening in society. And instead of me complaining, oh, I disagree with that and go on social media and complain and argue with people, 
you know, that's my opportunity to create art. That's where I did, my ideas come from is in direct response to something that I am either happy about or disagree with or mad. If it creates a, like this visceral energy in me, it's going to be it's time to create work. And I was been busy. I did a, a bunch of I did a couple murals. I was doing this work and I started um, developing other projects that I haven't um, really launched yet and other part like different extensions of um, the street memorials and how, what I want to do with it in, in the future. So I, I looked at, I look at it like, I don't even look at it as post COVID. I look at it as just continuing the work. Yeah. And it's all like, as an artist, as a creative, we, it doesn't matter. Like there could be, you know, it doesn't matter if, if there's not a, even a year, like there's like, we got rid of a year. We just continue till we live and then we die. We're going to do the work. You know, if there's no holidays, we're going to do it during the holidays. We're, gonna do, we're just going to continue. We're going to take breaks, but it doesn't matter. COVID. All right, get creative. Think of another way to fight through it and think of something different and how to recreate yourself. So as creative people, it's, it's just like almost like this continuum. Like we just create this work <laughs> um, until there's no more time to create it. So COVID, post-COVID, COVID-2, COVID-3, yep. it's just you have to re-pivot and try to think of, what can we do? How can we be creative? How can we re recreate um, our thought presses to focus on something that's going to help make change? And the, the more crazy the world gets, the more opportunity for me to help people see it in a different way. So it's just, it's just like, it, it almost seems like the crazier the world gets. It's like, the more busy I'm going to be. Maybe I'm not, my, I might not be making money doing it, but I'm gonna be getting the word out well. And I think by working hard and being creative, everything else comes. You know, I don't, I don't really try to focus on, I'm gonna create this for that. I do am mindful about my business and making money too, but I'm like, I'm really focused on making the work. And I think making right. work, everything else falls into place. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, I, and I've always trusted in that. And I've been a strong believer in that for years and it hasn't failed me. So post COVID, in COVID, we're still in COVID. Like yeah. everyone's saying, 2020 was crazy. Oh my right. God, we're right. still in it. Yep. And COVID didn't start in 2020. It started in 2019. Yep. We're in the third year of it. Yeah. Technically, so it doesn't, I don't want to hear 2020, 2019, 2021, post COVID, we're in it. We're still in it. It's the worst it's ever been. And the one challenge that I think about COVID me being a public artist, my work is about connecting with people. Yeah. Every people on the street, almost going up to a stranger and talking to them. I can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And that kills me inside that I can't connect with people on that level. Even we did a mural in November in the middle of COVID um, in, in Kendall Square. We did this big mural and we really, there weren't people out. We couldn't really connect with people and talk to them and answer questions and just connect with people. So there's been challenges with that. So one of the things we've been thinking about, so like with the People's Memorial Project, um, we think about doing a Zoom, a, 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 a Facebook Live, not a Zoom, sorry, doing a, a Facebook Live or Instagram Live, or just be able to stream what we're doing in real time live. Um, so that's something that I'm thinking about doing. Um, a, years ago, I did a mural and we live streamed the murals. So I'm trying to figure out ways I can do that. So people can, um, you know, do, you know, we live streamed it through, I think, the Boston Globe. So we had it on there and it's a platform where people are coming to the regular um, regularly and then they can see it. So I'm thinking about ways to get interactive. Mm -hmm. um, um, right now, the truck, we're reimagining what the truck can be. And it's, it, you know, I wish the truck was on the road right now because we could do so many creative things. We could use the truck to bring food to people. Um, I was kind of sad that we weren't able to use the truck to utilize it to connect with people during um, with the beginning of COVID because we could have used it as a, a resource to, to connect with people with food, with art kits. We could have projected off the truck, right down to like a big like city and just like, I mean, neighborhood and projected movies off of it. We could have did music on top of the truck. There's a lot of cool ideas that I thought of, um, but the truck is kind of being, you know, repaired and reimagined what we're going to do moving forward. So there was some challenges with that, but there's definitely challenges, but it's like, how can we think creatively? Right. You know, that's our tool. That's the gift that we have as artists and make people see things differently during whatever challenge 
resources we have, taking the limited resources and using that to create um, something new. So post COVID, you know, I'm gonna continue doing this work. Um, and I've been um, pretty connected creatively um, within of ideas that I wanna bring out into the world. And, you know, I just wanna continue. Um, COVID, no COVID, post COVID, pre COVID, 2019 COVID, 2020, 2021 COVID, just, you know, even like, so another thing that I didn't mention earlier is that I just recently got proposed. I, I proposed to my, my partner of um, a long time, finally got the courage to do it. And I did it during COVID and I wanted to do it this year. Um, I was gonna do it in Jamaica, but it got canceled. So, you know, I, we just, just do it. Like, it just made me realize like time is really limited and you know, you gotta show the people that you love that you really love them. And before it's too late, before you don't have time to see them. Yes. You know, I know people that actually died from COVID and it, it's, it's really sad seeing those people go um, that I actually knew personally. And, you, you know, we don't know how long we are in this wor world. And as artists, you know, I think we have a duty to bring some light before, you know, it's, it's too late. So right behind you is, um, Yep. Pieces that I, the pieces that I created. Um, so no matter what's happening in this world, we, we, we can think creatively and we can pivot and find ways to connect. And I think that's what I've, you know, found within during COVID that mm -hmm. I need to do more. Um, so. Well, Cedric, thank you so much for um, the generosity of giving your, your time today. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure we'll be talking again because there's a lot, there's a lot to talk about, a lot to explore, and uh, I think you hit it right on the head today. So really, thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate it. No problem. Um, my pleasure. And.